we've been working in uh, high performance buildings for almost 10 years now, actually more than 10 years. And uh, when you talk about high performance in buildings or any kind of device, gadget, cars, whatever, uh, very easy to sell a higher uh, product than when it comes to testing it and using it out and living in the building and using the building every day, uh, things go wrong. Uh, things go wrong for different reasons. Expectations are not met. Oftentimes they are met, but you know we as an industry, and the industry includes everyone using buildings, including homeowners, uh, we do need to have this kind of uh, check and see you know, if the effort that we're putting toward having better performance and better products is worthwhile or not. If we are making a difference or not, and if not, what can we do to improve that? So today uh, we're going to talk a lot about you know green buildings and things that look flashy. And this is the bullet point in Seattle, one of the greenest and most sustainable buildings in North America. And you know, in recent years we've seen a lot of you know PV panels, boxes that go on your walls and nobody knows why. Tesla batteries, <laughs> high performance products, and we've seen a lot of you know, certification uh, bodies that can come in and say, hey, yes, what you're doing is good, good for you, good for the environment. You know, we, we can see a lot of organizations and institutions that come in and say, hey, what you're doing is actually better than the, ne the guy next door because XYZ. And collecting data is a way to see if XYZ is actually correct or not, and if we actually make a difference. So we're gonna see today why collect data is important. Uh, which metrics we're looking at. Tonight we're gonna to look at energy, but also on a number of other uh, performance indicators for buildings. Buildings should be for people first. And so there's a number of ways you can measure high performance in a building beyond energy, while energy is still important. And how to get uh, that performance right if, if you are considering doing that. Uh, when I was coming here, I was kind of think of thinking of analogies and you know, how, how many of you have you ever used a thermometer at home to see if you have a fever? Raise your hand, okay? How many, how, how many of you have a, a laser scanner for you to see if you have a, I don't know, malfunction in your lungs? Something like that. You do? <laughs> <laughs> you don't, because there's some sense of, for medical that you can buy at the pharmacy and they are affordable and some that are just highly professional. Construction industry is starting to implement thermometers today. <laughs> we are catching up. <laughs> and so some of the uh, data that we're gonna, are gonna show you today, I mean, most of that is collected from the field from our own project. Some of them is from somebody else's project. And the budget for, for that data collection ranges from anything from 20 bucks to 40 grand. You know, there's the thermometer you can buy at the pharmacy, there's something you go to the hospital for. And we can talk about costs at the end. I, I'm not covered exactly the type of sensors during the presentation because it's boring. <laughs> uh, but I'm happy to talk about that if you have questions. So why collecting data? You, you put effort in designing, you do a lot of math and calculation. So you know, measure and verify what you're doing as a professional is key. Also to assure quality beyond the just bare building inspection. You know, if you just uh, right off your house, you may be happy with just uh, having a guy, the building inspector, come in and say, yeah, check, you have light, you have running water, you're done. Uh, and don't expect the building inspector to do much more than that. Uh, if you want to keep everybody accountable in whoever you're hiring, you may want to consider doing more than that. Uh, occupant awareness and uh, education. If you occupants have no idea that they should be using uh, the building a certain way, don't expect them to, and the performance of the building may be very different, including not only energy, but also the um, uh, health and comfort condition inside the building. Uh, we had a project where th uh, they ended up having mold issue, a mold issue. We installed a mechanical ventilation system, all good. Then they decided to switch it off. And that was a building that was capable of being healthy, it ended up not being because there was no enough ventilation. So awareness and education is a huge uh, key. Marketing and communication, bragging rights go because if you put extra effort and money towards making your building uh, 
better. There's no reason why you should not be using that to promote your business and to promote your building. Uh, questions, question code, standards, and design methods. As an Italian architect, I do love to question standards I work with. I don't like to comply with any code. <laughs> and I show some examples of standards that are uh, setting the bar too low for the building industry, and some of them are the, where the numbers are just thrown in because we honestly don't have a, an idea at this time, point in time. And learn from mistakes because we all do uh, some mistakes. Cure uh, the placebo effect. Oh, it's, it's a green building. It's great. Yay. So marketing is very easy to do with green building. Whether or not that is an actual better building than the building next door, we don't know until we measure it. So uh, point number one in measuring data is to see if what you're promised is actually delivered. So the placebo effect is something that we should try and remove by collecting data. The second one is disrupt the confirmation bias. I've, been, I've seen this before, I already know what to do. So this is nothing to, the picture shows a construction site we had back home, has nothing to do with the data collection. We just had a roof leak. We just had complete the roof, which was, this was the roof, and we saw a leak coming from underneath it. So, well, it must be the penetration of that duct. They didn't see it properly. Like, it was exactly following the slope line, it was exactly there. Like, there was no question we had, it was the architect, the engineer, uh, the contractor, the roofing company. No question asked, like, is that pipe penetration? Turned out to be a screw. And we all looked like fools. And that is what we were. And we were all confirming our theory. We were not questioning what we knew already. We went in trying to solve a problem that we were looking at the wrong thing. So this confirmation bias doesn't have to do with data, but it's an example of how a profession can be very easily fooled. And collecting data gives you a better help in understanding what is going wrong in the building if something is going wrong. So which performance metric we're looking at today, you know, energy of course is one of them, including consumption, production, and net zero coverage of a high performance building. But also on the building envelope side, uh, air leakage, uh, something that is being required by code now. Moisture management in buildings, thermal quality, thermal resilience, heat recovery, and indoor air quality. These are just some examples of where we play with sensors here and there, and we can give feedback on what things, uh, where things are working, where not. Now, looking at energy consumption, we have a broader spectrum coming from different countries, starting from the UK. Uh, you see a different range of uh, heat loss coefficient, like how much heat the building uh, loses, expectation versus additional increase. So basically, the lighter color is what was designed for, and the darker is how much more above the design goal it ended up being very wide range. A comforting thing of this is that some of these buildings were designed to actually be high performance or passive houses, and the performance gap was minimal compared to the least performance building. And some of that has to do with uh, how buildings are simulated and how buildings are designed and calculated. Uh, coming from Germany, uh, performance gap measured in what they're called low energy buildings uh, as opposed to actual passive houses. And the performance gap in passive houses was remarkably lower than in more generic high performance buildings. And coming to LEED and looking at different classes of LEED, uh, we see a different, a, a, a different range depending on the building uh, class of LEED. And more importantly, we see that the, the higher the, per, the performance of the LEED project, the broader the gap, and the less accurate the result is. And a lot of that has to do also, also how accurate the simulation method is. So in this, the energy consumption, the gap could, could be caused by the accuracy of the simulation, how detailed the design can be, how good the actual building is built by the commissioning, and the user behavior has a huge part of that. Now, just a, a very quick detail on a, how uh, the simulation of a building like that can be influenced by the data you input in the software. And looking at a very dumb component like cellulose insulation, which most of you probably have in their own houses, uh, this graph shows 
the thermal resistance of one inch of, in, of that cellulose insulation depending on how humid that insulation is. The red one is the European data where the insulation is measured at different relative uh, humidities. So the more wet or the more just humid, not necessarily wet, the more humid that insulation is, the least it performs. The blue data is the American one. There's one point. Because they are so good. <laughs> and you know, uh, there's a conflict of interest there uh, with the software. The software does multiple things. And if you have only one data point, which is the driest, is more conservative when you want to simulate the moisture inside one assembly. So having one, just one data point for the American material is actually a better thing. But if you're looking at the whole building performance, that is a very bad thing. So the same value and the same metric can have a very different influence whether you're looking at just one wall or the whole building. So it, because we're talking high performance buildings. The closer you get to zero, everything counts. Every little spec counts. So the same data can be very acceptably conservative in one scenario and overly optimistic in the other scenario without getting too much into the details of that simulation software. Now, uh, jumping into energy production, so renewables. Uh, this is data we, that we've been collecting from a PV field in a, in a passive house back home where the blue columns show the design uh, expected values produced by month. The dark orange shows uh, 2018 production, and the yellowish color shows 2019 production. And you know, PV is a relatively simple system. Uh, it, you look at very limited data points. You li literally look at the production only. It has little or no influence from the users because they just plug it in and use it. So when you have this kind of system, it's much more easy to collect data and to compare it with design uh, expectation because it's a very simple uh, stream of data. Now looking at this, what do you notice there? There's a, a big gap only in one month. Month of April we had a big gap and we noticed, so this is actually just compiling monthly data. What we do receive is hourly data and hourly data look like this where you have yellow is PV production, the red is the consumption of the heat pump Heat pump in that case does heating, cooling, and domestic hot water, and gray is the total. The most important thing there is that there's no production after a certain date. So for two weeks in April, there was no production of PV panels, of energy. Issue, and this is one added value of monitoring data is that we discovered that whoever set up uh, the safety system of that PV system did not uh, connect it to the alarm system in that, hey, the PV stopped producing and the PV system was not telling anyone that it was not producing. So at the end of the month, I was checking the data, there was a big gap, like what happened? We went in and we since did an improvement on how the uh, PV system is operated. So this is an added value of monitoring because we added one layer of safety uh, to the system. Uh, the next thing I would like you to, to see is that compared to the design data, the yellow, so the 2000, 2019 February, March production data is much higher. And this is climate change. We typically have very foggy and overcast February and March. And this year we had an extremely dry end of winter. So clear sky, high PV production, all farmers freaking out because there's no rain. But that's a different thing. Okay, so uh, that being said, we're looking now at, this is just monthly uh, cons consumed and produced by day. So you have direct consumption in orange, what the PV system produced and the building consumed immediately. The little yellow is energy that was charged to the battery and discharged to the battery later on for the use in the same building. And in gray is energy that we receive from the grid and energy that we supply to the grid. Okay, that is kind of the, the balance we look at. Now, if you look at uh, closer, 
and you, and you start doing averages. So if you look at the, uh, uh, this is uh, the gap between expectation while looking at different standards and goals of a project. If you look at how the net zero balance is calculated, this building for this month would have been a 55% coverage from PV panels. The reality was that it was less than 40%. So we were receiving more than 60% from the grid. So while this is, this is not a performance gap in the system, the, the system is working properly. It's the expectation that is not there. If you hear net zero, you say, oh, this is good because the building will depend less and less on the grid, and that is good. But if you do the math according to the DOE method, this is a 55% cover building. In reality, it's less than 40. So the gap here is in the expectation. Now jumping into the building envelope, uh, error leakage is uh, the effort in trying to uh, building, uh, building air tight so that you de reduce uh, convection through the assemblies and you make it more durable. And this is why builders end up uh, putting a lot of effort in, into installing the vapor retarder and air sealing everything so that it is so airtight and there's no air leaks. You measure that on site with a blower door test. Uh, the building code, 2015 code, now affected in Denver and other areas of Colorado, requires a value of less than three ACH. And ACH 50 is uh, the air changes that occur during the blower door test at the 50 Pascal temperature dif uh, pressure difference. Now this is so code require. This is what code requires. It is a, a somewhat unpredictable by design. You can design to say, hey, my building is going to be 100% air sealed, so zero ACH, and you design your air barrier going and your taping, all of that. But you just don't know what the end result is going to be because that is highly dependent on the uh, construction quality. If the design is poor, you're not going to have any air tightness. That's it. So design and construction need to be in place at the same time. But by design, you cannot aim for any goal. Now, the, the assuring thing is that with the proper training, you can get way lower than that. So uh, this, is, this is the ACH values. This is the threshold required by the IECC code, by the building code right now. In Denver, you cannot, you're not allowed to build anything more leaky than three. In a number of projects where we had builders, builders took the training and had never built anything like this before, they, they scored about 20 times more airtight. And there's not really a, a, a very big difference in, uh, in cost once you put in the effort. Once you put in the effort and the time to do that, it's about accuracy and deepening. If you have this goal in mind if, and you don't care and you have to go back and redo things you've done poorly, it's more expensive than putting in the effort to think of what you need to do and do it right the first time. So in this case, uh, code in, in my mind is setting the bar too low. It's, I guess it's low enough for people to start complaining about it and complaining is the first step in, towards learning something. Like that is useless, like I don't want to do that and then they will learn that they're going to uh, learn. But we've seen first time, as literally first time as uh, nail this uh, value very easily. Now, jumping into moisture management, if you build the building airtight, then what's happening with the moisture? So a family of four produces an average two and a half gallons of water vapor every day. In very leaky buildings, this is not an issue because it's very leaky. And in fact, in Colorado, we have the issue of buildings too dry in the wintertime. But for durability and energy efficiency of buildings, uh, code now requires them to be actually airtight. So you do need to have a proper moisture management strategy in place because moisture management equals durability. You don't want to have this kind of situation in your buildings. Uh, that is a building that was designed in a very non-resilient way. They use the dew point method, which is a very obsolete way to do it. Uh, they put a vapor barrier at the bottom, super vapor closed here under the rafters. They put a, a bituminous membrane at the top and basically they create a, a completely vapor closed sandwich. The issue is that on paper that works. 
But if anything gets in there, it stays there, and that stayed there, and that, that is the end of it. So, uh, so, so the new point is still used by a number of professionals, and it's something that we try to convince people to move away from. And at the same time, uh, some reference standards try to give, provide guidelines uh, in how to move away from that, uh, but they don't really know much of what's the reality. So this is, this is a, a monitoring of a, a building uh, where this is the reference standard that is uh, now trying to replace the dew point. The dew point is obsolete. They created something new. And they said, okay, this is the bar that you have to keep. And whatever, whatever you design, this is the, the starting value at the end of the construction. Because at the end of the construction, buildings are assumed to be very humid. But if you implement best practices in your construction, you, you end up with much, much drier and better buildings. So this is data we've been collecting in different points in a building in Montana. So this is hourly data that we receive through the internet. Uh, f coming from a wall assembly in Montana, and it is much lower uh, than expected. So, lower than that is moisture content in mass. Uh, so, basically, the, the goal is to uh, st calculate the building, assume a certain moisture content at the beginning, and then the building will dry out. But if, if ever these values were to pick above 20, that is where you start having your wood rotting, okay? So, and wood can rot even if it is completely dry, but if it is very humid. So that is why the dew point, the dew point is, at what point do I get condensation? Condensation is not the issue. If the issue is that for wood, if wood remains humid for a long period of time. It's not if the wood gets wet. If we're good, wood gets wet, and then it gets dry again, we're good. You want a proof of that, just be, take a piece of lumber, put it uh, under the shower, and then let it dry and see if it rots. It doesn't, okay? So while there were some substantially wrong concepts at the base of the dew point, because condensation is not the issue, uh, in moving away from that, we, we as construction industry don't have yet a, a, a clear understanding of where to set this bar because the data that we've been collecting on, on site is much, much uh, less conservative. Now, something everybody can do at home, looking at the thermal quality of your houses, and then we all get depressed. <laughs> so there's an expectation gap here as well. You expect building code to be addressing building qu uh, thermal quality of, of buildings. It is not. It is not accurate in doing so. And I can talk about that for a long time, but just trust me on that, you do not. So what you can do today, this is data that we've, been, we've collected in a brand new building, less than, now it is like two, two years old, complying with the 2015 code. Uh, you know, you, if you have 35 degrees on, on the inside of your window, is that comfortable? If you have 40 degrees on your, on your floor, is that comfortable? That, that complies with code. That complies with the brand new 2015 code that Denver is so proud to have adopted, and it's much better than 2012. I was at the, at the presentation tonight at the AIA, and I was told that there are areas of Colorado that are still on the 2003 code. So 2015 doesn't look too bad, but it does not address this stuff. Uh, so thermal quality of component is highly dependent on design and construction quality. It also how it depends on code, because if the body is not there, then builders and designers are not gonna do anything about it. Now, when you design components, you do this kind of analysis. This is a window frame looking at the temperatures. This is a brand new window that you can buy today. You're gonna have condensation. So it comes with a bonus, which is condensation. But this is the kind of analysis you can do on the computer side. But on, the, on your side at home, you can literally buy an infrared camera for less than 200 bucks on Amazon. And there's the little code for class for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this is something we, we try to scale off our builders and our actors with because this, this can be in your pocket as homeowners for less than $200. And in doing that, 
we have articles on our website where you can see what the temperature factor is. Basically, it tells you uh, the quality of your building component. Uh, it's, it's a ratio between the external temperature, the internal temperature, and the localized temperature. A value of one means that the local temperature is the same as your, as your room temperature. A value of zero means that the local temperature is the same as the outside one. Basically, in this climate, you want to be 70, 0 0.70 or higher. Okay? Having 0.43, do you think it's good? No. It's not. Good. This is something you can do at home. <laughs> then we can all get together and, and be sad. Uh, thermal resiliency. Re uh, how many of you are familiar with resiliency? Good. So it's the ability to recover or adjust easily to change. So when it comes to buildings and thermal resiliency, it means power goes out. How long is my building still operable from a temperature point of view before it's unlivable? So we had uh, a couple of snow blizzards uh, earlier this year. And power went out, especially in the east side of the city, for a substantial amount of time. And there was a number of people uh, with very uncomfortable places to stay. And I know people that had to go stay with family or friends on the west side where power was still being supplied because their places were unlivable. Those places are not resilient. The moment you unplug the house, that, that place becomes unlivable. And this is what we're trying to avoid with thermal resiliency. So in insulating and uh, LC in your building, you do get a very efficient building. You do get a very comfortable building. But also you get a building that is very resilient to change. So it, the moment the power goes out, that building is going to remain operable for a long period of time. So for, for like this is the workshop we teach. Th those are with our builders that we use free labels from. And we built those capsules we, that we call the passive pod. And basically, they are miniature buildings. Like each one of them is like 500 pounds, but you know, about this, this big. And uh, four of them have uh, passive house level insulation and windows and air sealing. And one of them has code um, compliant properties, meaning to, uh, Insulation level compliant with the 2015 code, which is in use in Denver today. Uh, and we heated them up and we rolled them outside in February and we left them overnight. So this is the temperature that was outside around freezing, not super cold, but about freezing. It snowed. And the, so although it shows higher temperature, we uh, heated them up with the same power for the same amount of time. So the difference in temperature here is more the relative position between the sensor and the little space heater inside each of the pod. But as far as energy supply to each of them, they all had the same power for the same amount of time. And then we rolled them outside on the balcony and we let them overnight for about 13 hours without any heating. So they cooled down. So the code, the brand new 2015 code, went down to pretty much freezing overnight without power. All four passive pods remain around 55. This is proof of concept. Mm -hmm. So that difference is about, in average, 20 degrees. And if you think, start thinking of hospitals, institutional uh, buildings, that in case of emergency, they need to remain operational in case of disaster, whatever. We need to build this into the way we operate our cities. Uh, Okay, so jumping to a completely different subject. Sorry about the jump, but I think it's also a way to keep you awake. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the heat, rec heat recovery ventilation? Okay, basically heat recovery ventilation is a ventilation unit, and I have a section up there, uh, where you uh, bring in fresh air from the outside, you pass it through a heat recovery core, and you supply, you preheat it with the exhaust air without mixing the two flows, and you supply it to the building, okay? It's a very dumb technology because it consists of two fans and one honeycomb for the heat exchanger. You also have a couple of filters just to keep the air inside the building clean. Now, some of the uh, units can recover up to 93% of sensible heat. 
which is pretty damn good. Uh, we did a, we got, uh, we, be, we have become pretty shameless in asking for sensors to be provided for this kind of testing. And so we uh, did a DIY monitoring of a high performance unit back home. And so we removed, so this is the unit, we removed the, the heat recovery core. So this would be where the air exchange occurs and where the heat recovery is. And we installed the four little sensors measuring the four different temperatures. DIY, but it worked pretty well. And this is what we measured. So looking at an intake air of about freezing, the passive heat recovery, so there's no actual active heat, just passive, it brings it up to about 70. 40 degrees uh, temperature jump. We adjust a heat recovery core. So there's pretty decent technology there that as far as maintenance, it requires changing the filters a couple of times a year, but it can be very, very efficient. This is, a, a, this is an HRD, this does not recover moisture. So the kind of ventilation you will be looking in this climb will be slightly different. But again, this is proof in, in the field that um, this kind of technology works. Now, ventilation is also used for indoor air quality. In fact, that is why we have ventilation in the first place. We air seal the building to keep the air from going into the assemblies and avoid that moisture to be let into the assemblies. And so we have to supply fresh air uh, to keep the indoor air quality high. In doing that, we also avoid the building breathing. The building, building does not breathe through the skin, it shouldn't. Also, the amount of uh, the ventilation rate that you would need uh, as human beings to stay inside the building, you would not get that kind of ventilation through just cracks and leaks for most of the year. So that ventilation would not be enough. So looking at ventilation and in the quality, you, you can measure a, a very, very a wide range of data points. Some of them are direct indicators of pollution. Some of them are indirect. CO2 is an indirect uh, uh, measure to see if the air is stale or not, because unless uh, CO2 is very, very high, it's not a pollutant per se, but it shows if it is, if the air is stale or not. And it's been used for a long time because for a long time, sensors to measure particular matter of VOC were not as widely available. Particular matter is particularly critical for uh, pollution because uh, different measures of particular matter can actually lead to cancer. And DOCs are also dangerous. And I guess it depends of a little bit on the use of the building. So DOCs, you're probably looking more in commercial buildings, whereas particular matter is more in uh, residential where you're cooking. If you're cooking at home, and, and please do cook at home, but you're, you're polluting your in, internal environment if you don't provide proper ventilation. So, uh, while setting ventilation goals in the states, uh, the goals are set sometimes uh, to get other parts of the industry to get away from putting regulation towards uh, the quality of their products. So if you look at ventilation rates required by ASHRAE, they are set mostly so that uh, whoever produces carpet or linoleum or other internal finishes don't have to be as accurate in controlling the VOCs that these products emit. The idea is to overventilate the, the building so that whatever pollutants are there, they can be flushed out quickly. So the health of the occupants is a kind of secondary there. In this case, and this is gonna be crucial for the, for the next picture that I'm gonna show, commissioning and operating of the uh, system is crucial for the indoor quality. This is a study done by CU Boulder in a number of uh, passive houses and very tight houses in Colorado. And you see a concentration of, uh, of CO2 part per million uh, over time. And so the number of time above 1,000 part per million. So 1,000 is an indicator, an indicator for CO2 saying, hey, the air is stale. Outside, we have about 400 going up thanks to climate change. Uh, but if it is about 1,000, it's an indicator where, hey, your air is stale. And this is showing that in some buildings, there was no issue with uh, CO2 accumulation. 
And in some other buildings, it was higher than 50%. These are, these are tight houses. These are passive houses here in Colorado. And a cause, a cause of this was the operation and the sizing of the ventilation equipment. So if you have a building that is a passive house, or this pretty much a passive house, this is one of the places where you start seeing the difference. If you had proper design, proper commissioning, you most likely have no issues with indoor quality. If you have kind of, oh yeah, I've done the R50 wall and people paint windows, check, 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 but nobody has actually done the math behind that, this is where you start having issues. The closer you get to zero, everything counts. Uh, this is a monitoring of particular matter in a passive house back home. And we see two levels of particular matter. So CO2 is this one, and this is particular matter. And 2.5, the orange one, is the most critical one. And it is the one that you can produce more at home, whereas the particular matter 10, shown in gray, is more due to outside pollution. Now, an issue that you see here is that we are blind to whatever is happening outside. The reason for that is that we do have a sensor outside. We just got disconnected thanks to the company that provided the system. So delivery of the data is also a big part of the picture. So in this case, we have lost the data of whatever is happening outside. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this shows also two thresholds done by the, set by the EPA. So uh, the, over 24 hour average, the particular matter 2.5 should be less than 35 micrograms per cubic meter, and the particular matter 10 below 150. How accurate those thresholds from EPA are? I don't have an answer yet. I don't expect them to be super stringent because how a lot of things are run in this country. I like to question standards, and I don't have an actual uh, answer on that. But you can see that, I mean, this is a bit that we designed, we did the balancing. There's some issues shown by the particular matter 2.5 because it steps over. This is, the dash one is the hourly value, the solid is the 24 hour average, that is actually what the APA requires. We, we have it, this is two month period, February and March, and we have it going up twice and I don't know why. I don't know what's happening outside. I don't know. I know that the filters are pretty clean. This is a bedroom, so there's no cooking, hopefully. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know. Anyway, so this is kind of the parameters you're looking at for indoor quality. Now, we've talked a lot about different, uh, well, lastly, indoor quality is much more appreciated by everyone, apparently, than energy efficiency. Energy efficiency saves polar bears and nobody cares. Whereas indoor quality saves you because you, uh, there's a stand, there's a statistic from ASHRAE, American Society for Heating and Cooling uh, Ventilation Engineers saying that our, we exchange about 70% in mass with the environment through breathing. So whatever you eat, whatever you drink, if you take the pounds of what your body exchanges with the surrounding environment, most of that is air. So unless you start eating poison, you know, the most of the exchange you have is by breathing. Getting it right, redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. Redundancy meaning that if you want to get one data point, you, get, you need to have several sensors because, can I say shit happens? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cables get uh, cut, sensors get disconnected by some reason, it rains and like, stuff happens. So redundancy means you build, a, 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 a system where you collect multiple data points also to verify if one reading is correct or not. The accuracy of sensors varies significantly. So if you have a sensor that costs 50 bucks and the next guy up costs 2,000, there's a reason for that. So there's a company now providing a certification of sensors for indoor quality. I've not seen anything for temperature or moisture content, I think they only do indoor quality at the moment. But they do rate different grades of accuracy for sensors. You know, if you're just a homeowner, say, hey, what's the indoor quality in my bedroom, you can probably get a grade C or, you know, not even rated. But if you're looking at 
uh, indoor quality in an operative chamber in a hospital, then you do want to have a much, much higher accuracy in the treatment. And, and you can donate the cost by ordering great oh, yeah. on Amazon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, also, yeah. So if you're looking at uh, metrics, the time frame you're looking at is very different. If you're looking at energy, uh, you're looking at at least three years operation. We have, we do have uh, passive house bidding that we are monitoring. We don't have three years of, of operation yet. That is why we don't have data from our own building for energy yet. If you're looking at uh, resiliency, that data test took 12 hours. So the, the, the kind of method that you're looking at will dictate also the cost of this kind of analysis. As I mentioned, uh, you know, a little sensor can be 50 bucks and the next guy up measuring the exact same metric can be 2,000. So in this, uh, uh, yeah, literally, uh, a colleague of mine did uh, the first certified passive house in Dubai. They have a, they had a budget of 40 grand of sensors installed, measuring all kinds of data. With redundancy, with data delivered online remotely. So there's a very big spectrum. So to summarize, uh, high performance is a process effort starting from the design, going through construction, commissioning, and management of a building. Uh, data collection is very useful in keeping everybody accountable in meeting the goals. If the goals are not clear and not set at the beginning, then what good is the data? So if you say, yeah, I want to have a, an efficient building, yeah, so if you don't set any goal, it's very difficult for that data to be useful. Uh, sense of becoming uh, more affordable and more uh, diverse, you can collect a number of data. You can buy an infrared camera on Amazon today for less than $200. So whereas until years ago, they were like $15,000. So you, you're gonna st if, if you get a contractor to insulate your walls, you can get an infrared camera to see, hey, you missed one bay of your wall, go back and finish it. It doesn't give you a very accurate result, but you do see that they miss one spot that you paid for, that already paid back for the internet, okay? Uh, with the sensors becoming more diverse and affordable, do expect to see a lot of data that is irrelevant, uh, inconsistent, and doesn't really make sense because with more data being available and, and nice pretty graph being more available, I've seen already uh, people bragging on social media about Stuff that if they can read, if they could read the graph, they, they, they could understand that they are showing something that is not working, <laughs> unfortunately. And last but not least, don't expect IT engineers to do to know anything about buildings, that, as if they have never seen a building before. That is, I can talk about that later off the record. Thank you for your attention.